In this video, I want to do some more examples of graphing polynomials without the use of a graphing calculator whatsoever, just using the polynomial and its factorization. Now, the first thing I like to think of is I actually want to think of what's the leading term, what's the constant term. And so we can multiply these out in our head. If we want the leading term, we're going to take all of the biggest powers of x's and put them together. So we're going to get a 2x squared times an x times an x. That's going to be a 2x to the fourth. The middle terms, eh, I mean, they don't affect the graph as much. Uh, that doesn't, doesn't make any bearing on the y-intercept or the end behavior. If I look at the constant term here, your constant term, you're going to get a zero. Because, I mean, after all, if you, if you expand upon this, this really looks like 2 times x plus 0 squared. You're going to get a 0 times a negative 4 times a 1. The constant term in this situation is going to be 0. So what this tells us is that our function, its y-intercept, its is actually going to be an x-intercept. So we're going to go through the origin on this graph. Because the leading term is 2x to the fourth, our function is going to have the basic shape of a quartic polynomial. It kind of looks like a parabola, although it might look a little bit flatter. But who cares about the flatness because of the x-intercepts? That part will look very different. We only care about the in behavior. So we see that uh, on the right-hand side, it's going to go up. That is, as x approaches infinity, y will approach infinity. And on the left-hand side, it'll also point up because it's an even degree monomial. As x approaches negative infinity, y will approach infinity still. So we have the end behavior. Let's investigate the x-intercepts, the roots of the polynomial. We already mentioned that x equals 0 is a root that came from the 2x squared. If you look at x minus 4, that gives us a root of positive 4. You switch the signs. And if you look at x plus 1, that gives us a root of negative 1. Now we want to focus on the multiplicities here. So we have a 2, we have a 1, we have a 1. So this tells us we have a multiplicity of 2 at 0, 1 at 4, and 1 at negative 1. So 4 and negative 1, these are odd multiplicities, which tells us that the function will cross the x-axis at 4 and negative 1. And then at 0, it'll just touch the x-axis because we have an even multiplicity. Now, when graphing these things, I often use the y-intercept as sort of like a starting point to go from here. Since we don't have the we don't have a y-intercept, there's two options. You could just pick a different point other than the uh, other than an uh, x-intercept, or in this case, y-intercept. Uh, so like you just pick x equals 1 and see what happens there. Or this is also a time to see what happens when you get close to the origin. So like, like we, could, we could investigate what happens as x gets close to 0. When x is close to 0, f of x will look like the function where you plug a 0 in for all of the x's except in the x squared. You're going to get a 2x squared times 0 minus 4 times 0 plus 1. I mentioned in the previous video that I don't, I don't usually use this technique very often, but when the function passes through the origin, it's something I do a lot because we don't have a y-intercept to use because it coincides with an x-intercept, and plugging in x equals 0 is a very painless process. So we end up with negative 8x squared. So our function is going to look like a downward-pointing parabola when we are close to the origin, right? When we're at 0, 0, it's going to look like a downward-facing parabola. And so that information, we're now with that information, we're ready to graph our function. Uh, we're going to go through the origin at x equals 0. We have an x-intercept at 4. And we also have an x-intercept at negative 1. So we might get something like this. Notice our end behavior goes upward. So since we have a downward-facing parabola, right, we have something like the following. Let's do the left-hand side first. The parabola points down at the origin, but we have this x-intercept that we have to hit at negative 1. So somewhere between 0 and negative 1, it's going to turn to come back up to x equals negative 1. At negative 1, it's going to cross and go to the other side. And then we're going to go up, 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 up to match with the end behavior we expect on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, what's happening? Well, we have this downward-facing parabola. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to clean this thing up a little bit. That looks a little bit better. On the right-hand side, we have this downward-facing parabola, but it's going to have to bend back to go towards the x-intercept at 4. So we would anticipate our function to look something like the following. It's going to have to be a turning point when you go from 0 to 4. At 4, we cross the x-axis to go up, and then we have to go up and up and up to match with our end behavior. So this is what our function is going to look like. We see there's two turning points somewhere. but There's one turning point between negative 1 and 0. There's another turning point between 0 and 4. These are going to be local minima. They're exact locations. We don't know where they are. Uh, because 0 has an even multiplicity, we do know there's a local maximum at x equals 0. 
Uh, in terms of inflection, there's going to have to be some inflection points right here and right here, somewhere between that local, the local minima and zero. Where they are, I don't know. We don't really care about that right now. We just want the basic picture of this graph. Now, if we were to take a look at a computer-generated image here, you would get something like the following, which you're like, well, that's, that goes really, really deep there. Let's zoom out a little bit. You can see that with this one, the local minimum is actually really, really far below the function. This one, again, is, is drawn to scale in this situation. When we were graphing this, we didn't have enough information. Let's sort of start plugging in lots of points into the machine and to turn them out. It might not be obvious where this local minimum is, and we wouldn't be so obvious that it's so far below. We're not looking for that at this moment. We want to figure out how does the function turn and bend. We don't actually care about the exact depths of these local extrema right now. Because like I mentioned in the previous video, at this moment, we don't know how to find the extrema. We know roughly where they'll exist, but we don't know how tall or deep they're going to be. We need calculus to help us out with that. And so for that reason, we're going to be ignoring that. When I drew the picture here, I drew this one. This one kind of matched up, but I drew this one much more shallow and far less steep than it was right here. That's okay. We just want the intuition of what's going on with this picture. We don't need a picture perfect yet. We just want the intuition. Let's do one more example here. Let's take the polynomial P of X to equal negative X cubed times X minus one squared. Um, if you've been following this series, I'd actually encourage you to pause the video right now and try this example on your own uh, to see what's going on here because I think you have the skills to do it. Uh, but we'll come do it in just a second. So let's, let's graph this one, P of X equals negative X cubed times X minus one squared. The first thing I like to do is think of the end behavior. If we multiply this thing out, we're gonna take a negative X cubed times an X squared. That'll give us a negative X to the fifth. That's our leading term. And our constant term, well again, you'll see that this one actually is X minus zero cubed right here. So you're gonna take zero times one. This thing doesn't have a one, well, it's one intercept to zero. The constant term here is gonna be zero. And so this does inform our picture. Uh, we're gonna go through the origin. Our in behavior, because it's an odd monomial, but it's negative, this actually tells us that as X approaches infinity, normally the graph points upward, but because of the negative sign right here, we've actually reflected it downward. So as X approaches infinity, Y is gonna approach negative infinity. So we expect that the bottom will be pointed in the bottom right. On the other hand, as X approaches negative infinity, odd functions always do the opposite. So if one side is pointing down, the other side needs to be pointing up. So as X approaches negative infinity, Y will approach infinity, which means that our end behavior is gonna be pointing up on the left-hand side. Now let's investigate the X intercepts. Uh, looking at the factors, we have an X intercept at zero and an X intercept at one. So we're gonna get that X equals zero and one as our X intercepts. What about their multiplicities? Well. X, uh, X equals zero came from X cubed, which shows up three times. Odd multiplicity means that our function is going to cross the X axis at the origin. And when you have X minus one here, that shows up twice. So the multiplicity of one is gonna be two. And so because of that, our function is gonna be touching the X axis because we have an even multiplicity. So let's mark up our X intercepts. We already have zero, we need a one. So I'm just gonna put some space right here and get a one. Uh, think about our multiplicities here. It's nice to have a test a starting point. I like to use the y-intercept. You can just pick any point if you wanted to, to go from that. You can try like x equals negative one. You could plug it into the function to see what happens. Personally, I don't like doing, I'd like to do as little arithmetic as possible. So what I'm gonna do to help, the next thing to get started here is I'm gonna actually figure out what happens when x goes to zero. So if there is a y-intercept other than zero, I'm gonna use that y-intercept to get started connecting the dots there. If the y-intercept is zero, I'm gonna figure out what happens as x approaches zero. So I'm gonna take p of x here, and it's gonna be approximately the same thing as negative x cubed, but for every factor other than x, we're gonna plug in zero. So we get zero minus one squared. This would simplify to be negative, you're gonna get zero minus one, which is negative one, squared is a positive one. So you're gonna get negative x cubed. That's what it's gonna look like near the origin. So as we're near the origin, you're gonna get something like this, negative X cubed. Well, on the left-hand side, the end behavior tells me I need to go upward, which is great. So you're gonna go off towards uh, infinity on the left. And then on the right, notice that this is crossing the X axis at the origin. 
On the right, we have to connect and touch the point x equals 1. That's an x-intercept. So at some point, we're going to have to bend upward and touch the x-axis, but not cross it because it's an even multiplicity. So we're going to touch the x-axis and then come back down, pointing to the bottom right, uh, which would then match up with the in behavior we expect over here. So you see something like the following graph. Uh, it was up on the right-hand side, came down, bends back upward, and it comes back down like this. This is the basic shape of our function if we remove the x and y axes there. Let's take a look at the computer-generated image. Uh, we see something like this. Well, unlike the last example, we had a really deep y-intercept, our uh, local minimum. Here, the local minimum is really shallow. Um, it barely, barely dips down. I mean, it does. We can zoom in, of course. It barely dips below at all. And so again, our point is not to determine where the, how deep or tall the local maxima or minima are going to be. Our point is not to determine where the points of inflection are. Just using behavior near the intercepts and the end behavior to give us this picture of the polynomial. And it does, we're doing really good. We have enough of information about the graphic here uh, from this behavior right here. And so this is how we're going to be graphing polynomials in this unit. Like I said, is it perfect? No, but without the final, the final piece called calculus, we actually can't improve this without just calculating 10,000 points. Uh, and that's not what we want to do. We don't want to graph a function just by connecting a million points together. That's computationally very inefficient. What we're able to do is with very little effort, we can get the, a fairly accurate picture of these polynomials. And that's the type of polynomial graph we want to see in this chapter.